notice in verse, uh, let's see, I'm just, I, just to jump into context there, uh, verse 6, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now we are absent from the Lord when we're in this body. And uh, you got to think about that. God has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. But we are absent from the Lord. He's not on this earth. Uh, and we'll look at that in a moment. But he goes on, he said in verse 7, and it's in parentheses, and in a parentheses in your Bible is an afterthought. In other words, Paul wrote verses 6 and 8. He goes back and he has a thought after he wrote that, and he injects it in, and that's what a parentheses is. It's an afterthought to clarify what he just said. He said, we are, abs we are absent from the Lord. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He was willing to be absent from the body. Now, if you're absent from the body, what are you? I mean, what would we call you? We'd call you dead. But where would you be? We'd be present with the Lord. Well, to be present with the Lord would be where he's at, isn't it? So Paul looks in verse 7, he has the afterthought for we walk by faith, not by sight. Sight is the temporal things that Robbie was talking about. And the contact goes all the way back to chapter 4. In ch chapter 4, notice what he said in verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, this old flesh, this body that we are living in, perish, it's aging, it's getting old, uh, it's wearing out. And if you have any age at all on you, you know I'm telling you the truth. Uh, I'll soon be 54 years old. <laughs> I'm lying. But if I, in my mind, I don't feel like I'm 62. Uh, but in my body, I feel like I'm older because of the rheumatoid arthritis and, and the things that this old body gets and, and, and it's pain and, and, and it's wearing out. It's perishing and we're getting old. And one of these days, if the Lord doesn't come, I'm going to fall asleep and I'm going to be absent from this body but where will I be? Present with the Lord. Now you, you've got to think with me. Now look what he said. We walk by sight. I walk by faith not by sight. Verse 16 back in chapter 4. For which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish Yet the inward man is renewed week by week. I read that wrong. It's day by day. It's not Sunday by Sunday. It's day by day. It's renewed in knowledge. It's renewed. Now, look what else he's for our light affliction. And that always blows my mind. 
I mean, I, I, I think my afflictions that I have is not light. I don't think they're light at all. But yet, I look at the Apostle Paul. Here's a man that was stoned. Here's a man that every time he got on a ship, it sank. I mean, three times he's on a shipwreck. He said he was a night and a day in the deep. He was perils among robbers, perils among his countrymen. He was perils in the city and out in the country. Wherever he went, they stoned him. Uh, he was beat. He said three times he received 39 stripes. He was chained, so to speak, beat with rods. I imagine Paul suffered. He had some kind of a temptation uh, that was given to him and he called it a thorn in the flesh and that a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And that word buffeted is slap him around. I mean, this man, I imagine he suffered. I imagine this man probably had things <coughs> going on in his body, aches and pains. He was sickly. Uh, in fact, he was so bad that God had a physician, his own private physician, went with him everywhere he went, Dr. Luke. And he was, Paul said, he was the beloved physician. And this man, I know, and I look at this man, and I study this man's life, and I see his afflictions, and if he says his was light, Man, I don't even have no afflictions. And he says, though our light or our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now that glory has to do with what you're going to be. And it has to do with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not a place, it's a condition. And what you believe about this Bible is going to determine how much glory you have. And he goes on, he says, While we look not at the things which are seen, that's walking by sight, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. Everything you look at, everything you see with your fleshly eye is temporal. I think about the way the landscape has changed in the past years. I think about houses that one time was, uh, you know, you look at them and they were beautiful and you think, man, that's a nice place to live. And now they run down and some of them's fallen down. And, and though you might live in a new house, if the Lord doesn't come in years to come, it's going to be a, it's going to fall down. It's going to rock down. It's temporal. And that's everything you see. This old body is temporal. But he said, that, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's where your glory is. And Paul says, he goes on, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I will talk to you just the next 15, 20 minutes about walking by faith. We walk not by sight. Because the things that we can see, the blessings that Robbie talked about, the physical blessings, is temporal things. But we have a far more exceeding weight of glory that's waiting on us in eternity. We walk by faith. Now what do we mean by walking by faith? Well, I've said it many times, I believe that faith Simply put, is taking God at his word. I know that without faith, according to Hebrews 11, 6, 
that without faith it is impossible to please God. If I asked all of you today, if I went around pew after pew, I guarantee you everybody in this building, even the children would say, if I'd say, do you really want to please God? Everybody here would say, oh yes, I do. I want to be, a, I want to be pleasing to the Lord. Then you have to walk by faith. Uh, turn with me and look in First Thessalonians for just a moment. In First Thessalonians, and notice <clears throat> in First Thessalonians, in chapter four, verse one. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. That as you have received of us, Paul, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Then Paul left you the instructions how you can walk to please the Lord. And the Bible says in Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please him. Now there are some things about faith. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Uh, Rome, I'm sorry, chapter 10. Faith, you don't gain faith by sin. Now I love them girls singing. I think they're, I think they're great singers and I, I could listen to them all day. And I, the only thing about them is they don't sing enough. I wish they'd sing ever service. I think it's I think it helps. I think that God has given them talent. But you your faith is not increased through singing. You can hear them sing all day long, seven days a week, and you would not increase in faith. Your faith is not in you doing anything as far as your flesh is concerned. You don't gain flesh uh, faith by being baptized. You don't gain faith by praying. Uh, I, I believe in prayer. I pray every day. Uh, I don't hold much stock in public prayer because most of the time the person praying is trying to get his words in order so because he knows people's listening to him. And the people that's listening to him, they're waiting on that last word. Amen. Uh, they're waiting on him to get done. Or did you leave somebody out? I don't believe in much, put much stock in public prayer. I've always wondered why somebody on the radio leads in prayer. I mean, I'm going to pray. Now, you know why? I, don't, I didn't ask you to pray. I didn't pray. Why? You all have already been praying. I've already been praying about the service. Uh, I get amazed at these guys that, like I said on the radio, they say, well, now we're going to go and have a, and they'll pray for 10 minutes <laughs> on the radio. And I'm thinking, who wants to hear them pray? Uh, the Bible said, he didn't say, pray the word. He said what? Preach the word. Faith cometh not by praying. It cometh not by singing. It cometh not by taking an offering. It cometh not by what you do. But listen to what he said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith don't come by, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the newspaper. You don't get faith by hearing the newspaper. You don't get faith by hearing what's going on on NBC. You don't get faith by Fox News. You get faith by hearing what? The word of God then how important is the Word of God for you? It's how you get faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith cometh by hearing the Word of God, folks. That's why it's important to preach it. That's why it's important for you to come and hear teaching and preaching. That's where your faith is in. 
priest at it. Somebody say amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> so I want you to see the importance of the word of God. Turn with me and look in Psalm. I tell you what, go to Nehemiah first. Now, Nehemiah, there's Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, and all that. So look at uh, Nehemiah, chapter 9. Nehemiah, chapter 9. In Nehemiah, chapter 9, notice this thing. He talked to the Levites in verse 5, the latter part of the word. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above what? All blessings, All blessings and praise. His glorious name is exalted above all blessings and praise. Turn, look in verse of Psalm 138. I tell you what, before we go there, look in Philippians. We'll go back to Psalm. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2. And notice in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 9. Philippians 2, 9. <clears throat> Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus Christ, and given him a name which is above every name. Then God has given his name is above every name. It's a glorious name, and it's exalted above all blessings and praise. That's pretty high, isn't it? That at the name, look at verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you know what that says? That says that every knee, that is not just the sinners, that's you, that's me, that's saved and lost. We got to bow our knees before God the Father and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. None excluded. He has given him a name which is above every name. Look with me in Psalm 138. In Psalm 138. And notice, and this will show you the importance of the Word of God. In Psalm 138. Notice what he says in Psalm 138. Verse 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Them gods is with a little g. There are gods out there. Notice what he said, before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Do you know what's exalted above the name, the Lord Jesus Christ? His word. That book you got that's in your life is the Word of God. It's without error. It's God Almighty preserved it in English for you Gentiles so that you can read it and your faith, hear it preached, hear it taught, 
and your faith can be increased by that book. If you don't have the King James Bible, you don't have God's Holy Word. I get amazed at people talking about these different translations. Most of the translations in John, uh, Mark 1, verse 4, tell a lie. Do you think God can lie? If God Almighty put down His Word, then it's true. They're pure words. Look, hang on to Psalms and turn back to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, I started to bring, I have a copy of some different translations that I look at. And you get amazed at some of these things. But look in Romans chapter 3 where Paul talks about man. Notice in verse, uh, let's see, Romans 3, uh, 4. But God forbid, let God be true, but every man a what? A liar. We lie, folks. You lie, I lie, well, you lie. I mean, you might say, call it stretching the truth. Uh, well, I didn't really lie, I just sort of didn't tell at all. No, you lied. God is true. Look at that. But let God be true, but every man a liar. And it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Every God, let God be true, every man a liar. Folks, God is faithful. God is true. Look back in Psalms where you was at. Turn to Psalms 12. In Psalms 12. You don't have to worry about that book you've got. You don't have to defend it. It will defend itself. Paul said we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Look what he said in verse 6, Psalm 12, 6. The words of the Lord are what? Well, if I got a book and some of the words are not pure, is it the words of the Lord? No. His words are pure. As silver tried in a furnace to earth, purified seven times. The word of the Lord. A pure word. Look in Proverbs. Look in Proverbs. And those in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs chapter 30. Now you know something? Uh, verse 6. Proverbs, I'm sorry, verse 5. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto the, his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Do you know in Mark? Turn to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1. And notice in Mark chapter 1. Now folks, you know this book? God Almighty has exalted His Word above His name. That's why it's called Holy Bible. The words in here are pure words. They're God's words. They shouldn't be taken lightly. We ought to reverence the Word of God when it's being taught. When it's being preached, there ought to be an awe in your heart. You ought to be listening and saying, what would you have me to see, Lord? What would you have me to hear from you today, from your word? If you don't come to see something out of God's word, you're coming for the wrong reason. This is God's doings. This is His ministry. And you will, you will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of your attitude toward His Word. You 
you want to see something what people thought about that book you got? I was reading some of the things where the people that stood for this Bible, they were took out and tortured. They were set on fire, tied to a stake, a stake and wrapped up and the logs and the stuff and the wood and the stuff and they set a torch to it and they began to burn and they would not recant because they loved this book. They wanted others to have this book. They wanted people to have what you have. And they would print them and they would translate it and they would print it and print it and they'd give their life so you could have a book. God Almighty preserved this book. I read where they took animal skins. They would take animal hides and wrap people up in those bloody animal hides and take them out there and then the wild dogs would come and tear them hides and eat them alive because they would not recant. They died for that book you've got. It's not just some literature. It's not some just some other ordinary book that God has left you with. This is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He preserved you a book of his will. We ought to be in awe of it. We ought to come with respect. Lord, what would thou have me to hear? Help me not be a hindrance to other people that would hear it. It's a powerful book. Look at Mark chapter 1. Notice what he said in Mark chapter 1. Verse 1, he said, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, that say prophets? Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Do you know in the, uh, different, the modern translations, they don't say prophets. They say prophet. There are two prophets there. You'll find one of the prophets is written in the prophet. One of them is Malachi chapter 3. The other one is in Isaiah. But the other translations don't lead you to believe that there are more than one prophet. They believe that as one prophet said the whole thing. Now tell me something. Is that true? Is it? No. No. Then it's a lie. Then them words are not pure words. The other translations take out the blood. And I don't have time to go through all of these things. I want you to see that that book you have, that is the word of God. It is purified. God Almighty had men and women that gave their life for you to have that book. It's an important thing. It's magnified above his name. Look back in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Notice in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the King James Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the King James Bible. In Psalm 118, verse 8, that verse is the middle of the Bible. Verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord. Psalm 118, 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in 
man. That's the middle of your King James Bible right there. <coughs> In the middle of the verse. The middle of the verse the word in the verse is the Lord. The Lord is the middle of the verse. That's the middle of the Bible. This is God's book. Count them. Verse 8. How many words are in that verse? One, two, three. I'll tell you what, I'll read it. You count them. It, what? Is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. How many words was that? Fourteen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you have Lord. Then on the other side of Lord, you have one, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry, the Lord. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you have the Lord. One, two, three, four, five, six on the other side of the Lord. That's no coincidence. That just didn't fall in place like that. The very middle and the very middle of the verse, the Lord. That book you got is the most precious and the most glorious book you'll ever lay your hands on. Notice in Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, in this book has cleansing power. Notice verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed whereon thereto according to thy word. Folks, I want to tell you something. This book will mold your life. This book is more powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Folks, this book is words, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you are spirit and power. Paul said, my preaching came not with excellency of words, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit. The Word of God is the most powerful thing, but yet it's the most neglected thing in the life of a Christian. Notice what else he said. It's also turn to a look in uh, verse 28, Psalm 119, 28. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. You want to be strong? The Bible said, put on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the power of His might. Verse 10 in Ephesians 6 says that. Then he says, put on the whole armor of God. And that armor is not something that you manufacture. You didn't make it. That armor is supplied to you by God Almighty. And it's in knowledge and it's in words that are wrote down in this Bible. You want faith? Then this book supplies the faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the only way that you'll get faith. Look with me and notice this thing. It only, not only cleanses, not only strengthens, but it's a life. Look over in verse uh, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Notice verse 105. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You'll never get where you don't know how to go. It's got every answer to every problem you'll ever have. This book has every need. It'll fill those needs. It'll strengthen you. It'll cleanse you. It will make you what God wants you to be if you know the book. Now notice this thing and I'm going to close. Turn with me and notice this thing about faith. 
Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now you've got to rightly divide this Bible. If you don't rightly divide this Bible, your faith will not be increased. When you rightly divide this Bible, then you'll see how it will grow. Turn with me and look in uh, Thessalonians in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. God will use you, but he'll use you through this book. Notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he said there in verse 13, I'm going to read verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, you, uh, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word of God is what effectually works in you if you believe it. Uh, turn with me to Philippians and look in Philippians again. In, or back in Philippians, in Philippians, and notice in chapter, uh, again I see, chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, notice verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now watch it. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. God works through you. God works in you. And it's in his word is the tool whereby he works in you. If you don't let the Lord work in your life, you're not going to be pleasing to him. Your walk won't be pleasing to it. Notice this thing. It's God that works in you. Uh, as, let me go on and turn over with me to, uh, it has to do with knowledge. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. It's a walk of knowledge. Notice what he said in verse 9. Colossians chapter uh, 1 verse 9. He said there, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to, to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual or in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Where do you find out about God? You find out about in His Word. How does God work through you? By you having the Word of God in you. Why are you there in Colossians? Look over in chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3. In verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. He said, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know what the parallel verse to that? Singing and making and psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Look back in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm sorry, chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Wherefore, there, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. 
and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know what the fullness of the Spirit of God is today? It's having the Word of Christ control your life. Somebody that has excess of wine, they're, they're under the influence, they're under the control of that alcohol, and that alcohol causes them to do certain things that they normally wouldn't do. They're under that influence. They let the Word of Christ to be filled with the Spirit in the dispensation of grace is to be under the influence of the Word of Christ that God gave to Paul to give to you. And last thing in chapter 4, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, there's one more, one thing. Isn't that strange that the doctrine that God gave to the body of Christ, he calls it the faith. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. To grow in the grace and the knowledge. Folks, I'm glad that God one day showed me the truth of the mystery. I'm glad that one day I seen what rightly dividing does to this Bible. I'm glad that I was delivered from the denominational system that I was chained to. I'm glad that I got set free by the Word of God. And this book is precious. We have a precious thing here at Charity Bible Church. If you don't believe it, why don't you go to some of the other churches? Now you won't hear their pastors telling you, telling their members to come here. But I'm telling you, if you don't believe what you've got is unique, that is spiritual, then go visit some of these churches that's around and listen to what they say and try what they say by the Word of God. And I guarantee you, if you're saved, you'll say, thank God for Charity Bible Church. The reason why some people think it's just another church is because they've never been outside of here. And they don't know what's out there. God has given us assembly to meet together. He has allowed us. You say, I mean allowed us. To build a building, to make it as nice as we can, so we can come together, not to sing only, not to play, not to come here as a social gathering, but to come here to hear His Word taught and preached, that we may increase and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should thrill your heart. And it's a place where we can bring sinners and invite them to come, knowing assuredly that they will hear what Jesus Christ did for them and that they might be saved. Thank God for his book for the men that gave their life for it, for the men that stand today to teach it and to preach it, and for people to honor it with their presence and respect it and honor it as they hear it being taught. Thank you for being here, and may the Lord bless you this